All right, so good morning. Today we're going to do our in-service for September. This will be about infection control, all hazards, emergency plan. We'll talk a little bit about OSHA. But first, to get us started, we have Blair Gammon here to talk to us about our employee evaluation. So let's give it up for Blair Gammon! Come on now, you can do better than that. It's Blair! Try it again. Blair Gammon! <laughs> All right, thanks for coming this morning. I've got a couple of things to go over with you real quick uh, that we've got coming up here at Wendell Foster. So the first is our annual health fair that we have for all of our employees. That will be um, Wednesday, October the 2nd from 9 a.m. to noon here in the Young Building. Um, we will have our biometric screenings, which we'll talk about more in a minute, our flu shots. Uh, we'll have chair massages, we'll have a food truck, we'll have vendors. So if you are available, um, if you're working or if you want to stop by, feel free. We're going to have giveaways, goodies with bags, um, with stuff in it. If you are not able to make it, we will have extra bags that we will be handing out so uh, that you get all those resources. So that is 9 a.m. to noon on Wednesday, October the 2nd. We are doing our biometric health screenings again this year. If you were here last year, you may remember that we had the health park come and they were actually here during our health fair on that half of the room and they actually did the screenings for employees who wanted to participate. So our window for completing those screenings for 2020 is going to be Wednesday, October the 2nd through December the 4th. Um, so there's a several week period there that employees can participate. Um, this is open to all employees, regardless of your participation on our medical plan. Um, so what you may remember is that we test in five areas. We look at blood pressure, BMI, total cholesterol, A1C, and tobacco use. So for anyone who is on our medical plan, if you do the screening, you are eligible for $10 off for each of the areas that fall within the National Health Institute's target range. So you could get up to $50 off of your premiums for 2020 every month if you participate and you fall within these limits. Um, if you're on a bank or an employee plus children plan, you actually double those credits. You can get up to $100 off. So there is some money on the table if you wish to participate in that. Again, you don't have to be on our medical plan. You, of course, won't get the premium discount if you're not on our plan, but it is a good way to see where you fall and, and get some education on your own personal health. So there are two options for this. So option one is to actually do it here on site. That's October the 2nd and October the 3rd. They're gonna be here from 6 a.m. until noon. If you would like to participate in this option, we just ask that you sign up. We've got sign-ups over here on the table. They're 15 minute appointments. And so you show up, sign in, and they will take you to all of the stations, give you a counseling on where your health is, and then they will let us know what your credits need to be for the next year. Um, if you participate on site, you're going to be eligible to win a $50 gift card. So just keep that in mind. It's a, another way to possibly get some free money. The other option, if you are not able to do it on site or you're not comfortable doing it on site is that you can go directly to the health park yourself between October 2nd and December the 4th and get that completed. So if you want to use that option, just come to HR, we'll give you a voucher. You just call the health park, make an appointment, go up there and do the screening and then they will let us know what your credits need to be for the next year. They do recommend fasting for eight hours, highly recommended for your scores. We understand that not everyone is able to do so, maybe due to your work schedule, or maybe due to your personal medical um, situation. So we do recommend you talk to your doctor. They want you to fast, but I will not tell you you have to fast. Um, you just need to speak with your doctor and make a decision if that's best for you. Um, we do ask that everybody signs up by Friday the 27th, so a little over a week away, just so we can make sure that we have the appointments nailed down for that. And we will also be offering flu shots both of those days. Um, they are walk-in flu shots. Um, you may remember if you were here last year that in, in previous years, we've had a nursing department do flu shots for us. We are offloading that to an off-site vendor. So the health park will also be doing those. Again, no appointments, but we do ask that you sign up for that so we can make sure that we order enough vaccinations for everyone. Um, if you are on Wendell Foster Insurance, we will make a copy of your insurance card front and back so you don't have to bring that with you. If you are not on Wendell Foster's insurance, but you would like to do it on site, you just need to bring a copy of your insurance card front and back, and we can help you get a copy in the front office if you need to. 
If you are on our plan, Wendell Foster's plan, you will not have to pay anything. It's preventative service for the flu shot. Uh, if you're not on our insurance, I don't know because I don't know your plan design. Um, most flu shots are covered under preventative, but you may need to look at your, your plan options for that. All right, any questions about health care, flu shots, biometric screenings before I move on? Okay, so we do have a couple of events coming up here for employee appreciation. The first is actually going to be tomorrow night. It's here in Sensory Park. We're going to have a family movie night um, starting at 730. Uh, so bring your families. You can bring your friends if you want to. We're going to have snacks and drinks, and they're going to be showing Captain Marvel. Um, bring some chairs with you, too. We'll have some out there, but you may want to bring some extras. Um, we do ask that you sign up for that. I've got sign-ups over here on the table just so we can make sure that we have enough snacks for uh, everybody. And then actually next week, our next event is going to be an employee scavenger hunt. It's going to be a photo scavenger hunt. It's not going to be hard. It's just going to be a little interactive. You will get more details next week. I'm not going to release too much now. But essentially, you're going to be given a list of tasks to do, and you will have to document that you do those and send it in. And any employee who meets the criteria will be put into a drawing for several different prizes. Uh, we've got some AirPods, we've got gift cards, I've got two um, Holiday World Season Passes, a pair of those to give out. So some good prizes, some interactive things to do, so consider taking part in that. Any questions about employee events before I move on? Okay, so this is really where I want to spend a little bit more time is our performance evaluations. So uh, if you were here in, at the beginning of July, you may remember that we had supervisors hand out a uh, performance evaluation to you for this next year. We ask that you do a self-rating on your... ...for 2019. And the reason we did that is because we want to base wages and wage increases on performance. So if you have been here for several years, you may remember that in past years, we have established a percentage and you have given it to everybody. So everybody's going to get 2%. Everyone's going to get 3%. Um, what, we, what we see when that, when we do research, we find that we have our higher performers who are not um, appreciated enough, if you will, in their wages. And we have our lower performers who are still getting the same wage as our higher performers. So we really want to base those things on performance. So we created an entire system, so those of you who got that, you may remember getting it, doing your self-writing, and having a due date to turn that back into your manager. After your managers got it back, they worked really hard on um, doing their ratings, creating what they think the goals should be, um, all, of, all of that stuff. I think those were the biggest things, making sure that it's meaningful, that it's factual, that the information we have proves why someone should get a certain rating. Uh, it went up to their supervisor, went up to the VP of the area, and then it came to HR to review. So HR has reviewed all of those evaluations, um, and we looked at those to establish if they were fair and cons consistent across the entire organization. So it did one area rate their people accordingly compared to other areas. Um, can we prove someone's performance? If someone gets a certain score, can we prove that they should have gotten that score? What facts can you bring to the table to support that? Um, so that we can make sure that at the end of the day, everyone got a fair, a fair consistent, meaningful rating, and then their performance uh, merit increase will line up with that. So these are actually ready. Um, they will be administered soon. <coughs> But I wanted to take you through the rating area because this is what I think when you get your evaluation back that you may have a couple of questions about or you may wonder about. So in previous years, because merit was not tied to your evaluations and your wages, um, it was easy for supervisors to give a rating that maybe wasn't truly reflective of performance. So we really pushed back this year and gave some education to our supervisors on look at what true performance is and can and how do you measure that? How can you do that? So we have five rating areas, and so you'll see the definitions. Unsatisfactory is if it's consistently below expectations in essential areas, consistently not meeting those. Uh, needs improvement is that it's consistently not met, but occasionally it is. So it's not that it's unsatisfactory all the time. Sometimes it is met, but it's not that consistency that we're hoping for. Meeting expectations. This is consistently meeting expectations. This is where we want all of our employees to be minimum, okay? So meeting expectations is good. That means you're doing everything that we've asked of you. Uh, exceeds expectations. This is consistently exceeding the expectations in essential areas. This is a great score as well. It's a little harder to get. 
And then there is outstanding, which is far exceeding expectations in all areas. This is very difficult to get. So this is where I wanted to do some of education because when I looked through some of the ratings of the self ratings and also what the supervisors did, they were seen a little inflated and there seemed to be um, maybe a culture shift that we need to do because what we've done in the past with what we're doing now with this new process, uh, we just needed to do a little bit more education. <coughs> so if you get your evaluation back and you get a meets expectations, that is excellent. That is where we want you to be, okay? If you get an exceeds expectations, that's fabulous too. Um, but we do want you to know that uh, we saw a lot of people that wanted to, to give themselves and managers that wanted to give an exceeds, but um, my question whenever I got that was, can you prove how, how they need, need to get an exceeds? Um, what did they do? Did they save the organization money? Was there a quality of care? How did they go above and beyond? Can you prove that so that I can make sure that their exceeds is correlating to the organization's exceeds? Okay. We'll get there. <coughs> there we go. Um, so basically just wanted to educate you guys on that so when you get your evaluations back that you can take those areas that we assessed you on, that your supervisor assessed you on, compare it to the rating area and consider do I consistently meet these areas, do I consistently exceed, am I far above, uh, and then you can see kind of the thought process that was used when we evaluated you, when your supervisor did and when HR looked over it. So next step, we reviewed the scores. We went and worked with our finance department, it's our budget time, on what would be the merit increase for each of the ratings. So for example, if someone got a meets expectations, what percentage increase should that be for that person? So we looked at a couple of different things. Um, what is meaningful? If we say, hey, you did great, you got a meets expectations, you're on point, we're going to give you blank percent. Would you feel like that is valuable to you, to your increase, to your wages? Or would you feel that it's offensive? Is it not enough to, to show appreciation? Um, also, but what does the market dictate? So what I would love to do is give everybody a 20% raise, but I can't do that because our market doesn't dictate it and our financial situation doesn't either. Um, but we do try to look at the market. What are other employers doing in Owensboro, the region, the state, nationally? What are national trends? What are nonprofits doing? Healthcare, health services. So we look at a variety of different factors to try to determine what is the best wage increase to set for our um, for our location here, for our organization, which is difficult because, as you know and you've heard, we're pretty special, so it's really hard to get some of that information um, because we do so many different things and there's not a lot of organizations like us out there. Um, so we have established a percentage for this year for those different areas. Um, it's going to be based on the market and also what our financial appetite will allow. Um, we are waiting on approval from our board of directors for our final budget. Once we receive that, then we will be able to roll that out to all employees. Um, what I do want you to know is that percentage may change every year. So if you got a meets expectations this year and you got blank percentage, next year you get a meets expectations, it could be a different percentage and it's all gonna be based on the market and our financial appetite. Um, but the goal for you guys is that you are going to, if you were eligible for a performance evaluation and an increase, you were going to get your increase or get your uh, performance evaluation, the supervisor will go over it with you, and then they will give you a letter that is sealed that says such and such employee received this score on their evaluation, that equals this percentage rating, so your new annual salary or hourly rate will be blank, and that will be effective, you know, whatever the date is effective. So the concept is for you to really see the correlation between your performance being evaluated and how that affects your raise for the next year. Okay, so I know it was the first year, it's a new process, anytime a new process is put in place it can be a little bumpy, um, just that education piece and getting people used to it, but we'll, we're going to keep going and by year three everybody will be pros at it and it'll come more easily, more comfortable. Okay, any questions about merit increases or performance evaluations? Okay, the last part, I have to have you do this or Wes will get on to me. This is the confidentiality and code of ethics. We have that signed annually by all of our employees. Should be in the center of the table, so if you could grab one, read through it, uh, print, sign, and date, and then leave it in the middle of the table, and we will get it uh, at the end of the in-service. All right, thank you, guys. All right, thank you. And next up will be Kim Trainer. Now, set the bar really high for you guys. I told you guys to ask Really good humor. Starts off with a so she should be on the way in here. 
Before she steps in, though, I do have a message for the DSPs that work in the cottages. Kim was about to talk about infection control. What are we supposed to do with any lemons that are sold? What's the process for taking care of those? That's right, red bag. Imagine working in a laundry. Wearing your favorite shirt, it's a Friday, it's a great day, you open up a bag, of course you got gloves on, you reach in, pop the linens, now you have BM all over you. Could that be an infection problem? So let's make sure that anything that is soiled, whether it's linen or clothing, that we rinse them out, place them in a red bag, and if it's really bad, call laundry and let them know what's heading their way. So I'm sure we want the same kind of heads up too, right? So that's kind of a precursor for what Kim's about to talk about. Funny. Okay. Got it. It's too early in the morning for that. You got this. Good morning, everyone. All right. Everybody know the purpose of the Fetch Control Program? You guys all just want to get out of here, don't you? Huh? No? Prevent the spread of infection, right? What's the number one thing you can do to prevent the spread of infection? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. What's the most important thing you got to remember about washing your hands at Wendell Foster? Water. Turn the faucet off with a paper towel, right? You touch the faucet after you've washed your hands. You should wash your hands for a good 20 seconds. Um, just getting them wet and drying them off is not going to help anything, okay? Wash your hands often and well and throughout the day. That's one. Keep one your chest. Keep it in one Make sure I can put all my hands are spot. So you should wash your hands often throughout the day, right? Or whenever you suspect them to be dirty. All right, personal protective equipment. All of these items of personal protective equipment. When do you use your personal protective equipment? Mm -hmm. Anytime there's a possibility you could be exposed to body fluids, right, essentially. All right, so if you don't wear your personal protective equipment, and you've got a cut on your hand and you're helping someone to the bathroom and their urine gets on your hand where that cut is. What is that called? An exposure incident, all right? So I just gave you an example of an exposure incident, all right? If you're ever exposed to someone else's body fluids for like with that example, or maybe you got something splashed in your eyes, you should always let your nurse know, okay? going to talk briefly about hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a blood-borne pathogen that destroys your liver. Your liver is an essential organ for life. You've got to have one or at least part of one, right? It does a whole slew of things. But in the healthcare setting, how do you get exposed to hepatitis? Being exposed to somebody's body fluids, essentially, right? For nurses, it's usually needle sticks, right? That's why we have specialty needles but, and uh, sharps containers so we don't get stuck. Is that the only place you can get hepatitis? Mm -mm. You can get hepatitis from unprotected sex, tattoos, piercings, those types of things, okay? How do you prevent getting hepatitis? Nurses use the sharps containers, right? And they're careful with their needles. We have specialty needles that slide up and protect the, the shaft of the needle from, from ourselves, right? And if you've got cuts or anything, you wear your gloves. If you're going to be exposed to body fluids, you take precautions, right? Try not to get splashed or exposed in any way. So that's how you prevent it. HIV virus is also a blood-borne pathogen. This organism works to destroy your immune system. You've got to have an immune system, right? Okay. So how do you get it in the healthcare setting? exactly the same way as hepatitis. So if you're at risk for one, you're at risk for the other, right? Needle sticks, exposure to body fluids. Is that the only way you get HIV? No, unprotected sex, tattoos, piercings, IV drug use, right? Last thing we're gonna talk about is the flu, okay? The flu kills upwards of 40,000 people every year. Uh, I'm sure Blair told you next month we're gonna have our flu vaccines here. I highly encourage you to get it. How do you prevent yourself from getting the flu? Wash, Wash your hands. Absolutely. Wash your hands. If you have the flu, what should you do? Stay home. Stay home. Yeah, don't spread it to others. It's very easily spread. Do you guys have any questions? That's quick.
the top? You got all your answers? I'll do my best to uh, make this end painlessly, all right? Bear with me for two more things. This is a topic that uh, is kind of new to us here. Lock out, tag out. And I'll try to make this as simple as I can. We have great maintenance men here. They fix everything for us, don't they? In fact, we break things every day. I think Ronnie can agree to that. I really believe we can make some money being a proven ground for equipment. If they think it's durable, send it here to Wendell Foster. We'll send it back tomorrow in pieces. That's pretty much how it is, right? So they're always fixing things, working on stuff. And there are times when the item they're working on can be charged with electricity. It can be hazardous to them. So they had to put precautions in place to protect themselves. So they were going to talk about lockout tagouts. And this affects you because you may be working in an area in which maintenance has to lock out a piece of equipment. And the, the equipment that comes to my mind the most are, you know, breaker boxes. You have a breaker inside that you shut off to shut off electricity to an outlet, right? What would happen if they're working on an outlet and they didn't turn it off and they touched the wires? Yeah, they're gonna have a bad day. It's gonna be shocking. We don't want that to happen. Now what if they're working on an outlet, they turn the breaker off, and here I come, wondering when my computer's not working, I see the breaker's been flipped, I turn it on, what's going to happen to the guy? Yeah, he's going to have another bad day, and now I feel bad. So we have things that we're going to put in place to prevent this from happening. It's called a law. There are certain equipment that maintenance may be working on in your environment, or the people doing construction around here may be working on, in which it could become energized at the wrong time. They'll put a lock, lock on it to prevent that from happening. And that's what that uh, question on the test is about. To prevent an object from becoming energized. Energized meaning electricity or it's starting up. We don't want that to happen. We care about our maintenance men. We care about all of our employees. And if a piece of equipment becomes energized at the wrong moment, at the wrong time, then you're going to have a bad effect on them. So you may see this once in a while, and the protocol that will take place is if it's going to be something that needs to be worked on, maintenance will go around and talk with you. They'll tell you about it. They'll tell you that this may disrupt your computer use for a while. Maybe there's an item you won't be able to use for a while. They'll talk with you about it, let you know for how long it will be down, and then they'll apply the lock to it. If they can't apply a lock to an item, they'll use a tag. Now the locks and the tags, because it's a safety thing, they're usually red in color, universal size, universal shape. A lot of times we'll have the person's name on the locks, we know who applied it and on the tag itself. The thing is, as an authorized employee, they are the only ones that should ever remove that lock. And let me be specific. If I'm the maintenance man and I put the lock on, I am the only one authorized to remove that lock not any other maintenance man. Now if I forget about the lock is in place and I go home at the end of the day, I probably have to answer with somebody because I've left the lock in place and my supervisor can remove it, but it's going to require some paperwork. Those are only two, the only instance where somebody else can remove my lock or my tag. Now you are an effective employee. You're an employee that may be in an effective area or you could be affected by this lockout. We just want you to be aware of what's going on in your environment, and if you see something locked out, please don't touch it. If you see a tag on it, please don't touch it. Leave it as it is, because we don't want anybody getting hurt, and you don't want that on your conscience, because electricity can kill people. Now again, maintenance will talk with you when they're applying a lock, they'll talk with you when they're applying a tag, and they will talk with you when they're about to start something up. But just keep in mind, don't tamper with it, don't touch it. If somebody comes up to you and say, hey, can you remove that lock for me? Don't do it. Just tell them no, have them do it themselves. Whenever they're ready to release the lock, they will talk with you about it first. They're going to test the machine, and then they'll go ahead and remove it. Once it's removed, they'll tell you you're good to go. I made this business for us quite a few times when they're checking the generators out. They usually go through the building and let us know that, hey, your computer might shut off. We're switching over to the generators and test it. 
It's a very similar protocol. But we do have a lot of construction going on right now, so you may see this more and more. We want you to be aware of what's happening and be safe. <clears throat> Any questions on lockout and tagout? That's just a very general introduction to it. Just be aware if you see it, don't tamper with it. All right, now we're going to have the final topic of our all hazards emergency plan. How many people here, show of hands, were here during the ice storm we had years ago? How was our communication? Or was it? Yeah, it was a big joke, wasn't it? Phones were down, cell phones were down. Try to call your cell phone, you get the thing says all circuits are busy. It's crazy how that happens. Now, if it can happen once, could it happen again? So we need to be more prepared each time a bit like that happens. So now we are. So we have two forms of communication that we address in our all hazards plan. Our first is our primary, and that is the, the easiest way to communicate with people. We use a lot of that every day. Our phone systems, payment <coughs> systems, cell phones, fax and email. Our secondary forms of communication, that's our backup. It's stuff that we don't use every single day, but that we will if there's a need. I like to point out to everybody, for your own personal knowledge, and if there's ever mercy at home for you, text messaging is great to use. Whenever you make a phone call and it says all circuits are busy, it doesn't mean your text message won't go through. So that runs on a different system. And your text message only has a little amount of data that goes through the system, so you can get a lot more of that through the system at once. And here's a great thing about that also. You don't have to send the text message repeatedly, like if you're going to call the person over and over again and hoping to get somebody to answer, right? You send a text message once, if it doesn't go through, it does not disappear. It just stays there in the system waiting for its moment to be sent to the other person. So if there's ever an emergency, text messaging is a very reliable uh, method to use. So if all systems are busy with your cell phone, send a text message and then just wait. It may be two hours later, but that message will go through. And then we have our radios, and if we have to, we'll use runners. So you may know what I mean when I say runners. You may familiar with that. So if I have a message I need to send to Chardé, I may have a staff member with me, I pass them a message, they take it to Chardé, she sends a message, they come back to me. That's all we mean by that. That is the crudest backup plan for communication. We, hope we never have to get there, but if so, we can do it. Now every day we also use our paging system. I want to address this as a refresher. When should we page nurse staff? What are the conditions? Only an emergency, yes. What kind of emergency are we looking at? Life or death. Yes, if somebody's not breathing, somebody's bleeding, or somebody's unresponsive in general, alter level of, of consciousness, those are the reasons for a nurse stat. Now, if I just need a Band-Aid and I page a nurse stat, what are the nurses gonna do to me? It could be life or death for me at that moment, right? So let's not take it there if it's a situation that's a non-emergency. You can page for a nurse to call you at your workstation. That's great. <coughs> Remember when you're paging over the intercom and you're referring to cards A, B, C, or D, you want to do more than just the letters. If it's card C, say C as in cat, C as in cow, whatever else you can start with C. It just helps differentiate because, well, you know how it is on the paging system. It will pick up everybody else in the room except for you. Which is another great thing. If you're about to page something, Look at your co-workers and make sure they don't say anything embarrassing because they will pick it up on the intercom and announce it to the whole world. So just be mindful of that. And keep the phone about six inches away from your mouth or you'll sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. And nobody will know what you're saying. So it's just some tips for when you're paging. And I have to say, Mary does a great job every day on that, so we can take some tips from her. We also have the handheld radios that uh, sometimes we use and sometimes we don't. Key thing to remember is HIPAA. We never want to say anything on a radio that can divulge somebody's identity, medical care, condition, because 
while I have them locked down by certain frequencies, certain people that know how to do it can listen in. So make sure we maintain tempo at all times. And if somebody is listening in and they start talking filthy, ignore them, change the channels. Please don't feed the animals, all right? We know how people will act in this. We've seen this happen with Connor J a few times, so change the channel, please. We also have our angel radio uh, that's up the top of the hill. Roddy and I are the operators for it. The antenna is about 25 feet up in the air, give or take. Now, while it's grounded, is it a good idea to stand right next to it in the middle of a thunderstorm? No. I would not tempt fate. I'm pretty sure we put it up pretty good. Don't tempt fate, please. You never know what could happen. Now, if it does fall over, don't touch it. Because if we're using it to communicate, it can give you a severe burn to your hand or anything that's touching. It's a lot of electricity flowing through there. And every month I try to go around and check our emergency kits. And this month I checked them and every single weather radio was turned off, unplugged, and batteries were dead. <laughs> Which is not new. We know what happens. Those radios are annoying. The alarm goes off, it's loud, scares you, it won't shut up. We unplug it, do everything we can. I understand, I'm trying to find a way to where it's not as uh, staticky on those radios in the cottages, but I'm working with what I have. So please, let's leave them plugged in, turned on. If the alert does go off, hit the weather button. It will shut off the sound. You'll hear somebody talking. Hit it again, and it stops. That's all you have to do. So I'm working on a trying to fix that problem, but in, in between, please work with me on it. And the last thing that happens is a safety reminder, two of them. Anytime we're doing a fire drill, should we use the door hold open button so people can come and go very quickly? What would happen if we do? If it's a real fire? It helps spread fire. You get an influx of oxygen come into the building through that doorway, Suddenly the fire comes out of control. We don't want that to happen. So that includes propping the door open during fire drills. We want to train as if we're doing it in real life. So make sure we don't hold that door open. Open and shut it as we need to. I also had to make this put a new outwash station in the Elmore building, right there in the uh, media room where the uh, copier is. So just a little FYI, you can use it like you would anything else. Anytime you use an outwash station, I need you to let me know so I can replace the bottle. I keep them. I keep one in my office so I can replace it right away. And we need an incident report so we know what's going on and what can we do to prevent it next time. Now for the campus updates. Next week is a quarterly connection. I forget the date of it, but it is on Facebook. And the uh, sheriff's office will be here to do a presentation. So if you have an active warrant, I would really encourage you not to be there for it, okay? <laughs> Just saying, Chardet, I would be very careful about showing up, all right? You look kind of nervous there. Also, a half marathon is coming up. It will be, I believe it's March 14th, right up there. So if you have a friend that owes you a favor, this is the time to cash in, because we need some volunteers. In fact, we're going to make it easier to volunteer this year. Instead of having to go to somebody to sign up for it and get signed a pass, it will all be online. It will be open to Wendell Foster employees first. First come, first serve. You can go onto the website. When we open it, it should be next week. And you can actually sign up to volunteer for your specific duty that you're going to, you're going to pick. Once we pick ours, we'll open it up to everybody else. And other volunteers can pick what they want to do. And then... Uh, Pull this off of Facebook. Uh, our assistive technology department will be having a make and take program where they're going to teach people in the community how to make adaptive equipment for what's laying around the house. <coughs> kind of being like my guy, but I figure. And then they'll be able to take those items home along with the skills they've learned. So this will be Friday the 20th, 1130 to 1 p.m. We want your stories. We're great at what we do, aren't we? And every day we have great stories about what people have overcome, what they've done in life, and we want to know them. Because I share these with the board of directors. They want to know what you guys are doing. And whenever I share these stories, they get a feeling, uplifted feeling, they get their morale boost, and they know that we're doing good work here. 
Now, while I know that every single day this stuff is happening and we get used to it, we don't see it as a story, it really is a good story. So share these moments with me. Uh, it doesn't have to be really big like Zach getting a tattoo, which is totally awesome. It could be something such as somebody achieving a program, but as you see these things, please let me know because I will share these with the board. I will invite you to the board if you want to, along with the service recipient. If that scares you, that's cool. I'll do it on your behalf. But I just want the story shared. So if you come across some really good stories, please send them my way. And finally, today is the deadline for Employee of the Year. Now, you don't have to just submit one paper in. If you work with several really awesome employees, submit the papers in for them. But we want you to submit your uh, co-workers in for Employee of the Year for bragging rights for how awesome they are. Plus, they get an invite to the annual board dinner. And they will have an article spotlighting who they are, the great stuff they do in a holiday newsletter. So no matter how shy they are, go ahead and nominate them. Do it. They deserve it. Let's make it happen and see what we can do. Any questions on that? All right, so we're good. All I need for you now is to place your papers at the center of the table. Please put your trash up, and I'll see you guys at the health fair. Thank you. <coughs> Oh, you're fine. I'll cut it all out. None. <laughs> I will call you out on that. <coughs> no. <laughs> no.